Okay, this is part three of our tutorial on drawing of Lewis structures. This part of the tutorial will focus on drawing Lewis structures that violate the octet rule. There are some limitations to the octet rule in some cases where that rule is violated. We'll give you some examples of those. Covalent compounds of beryllium, where beryllium will normally have four electrons instead of the eight that's required by the octet rule. Covalent compounds assume you group 3A elements like boron, where boron may have six electrons, for example, instead of eight. Although there are some compounds of the group 3A elements that do obey the octet rule on occasion. Substances which contain an odd number of electrons. If you have an odd number of electrons, one of your atoms will not have eight electrons. We'll talk about that more in detail in a minute. There are substances that the central at atom needs to have more than eight electrons to accommodate all the substituents, or it might have extra non-bonding electrons, or something like that, where it has more than eight on the central atom. Compounds of your D and F transition metals, since you have those Ds and Fs, you can accommodate more than eight. However, we will not consider those compounds in this tutorial further. Substituents attached to the central atom almost always have the noble gas octet rule configuration, and it's the central atom that's going to be allowed to violate the octet rule. And only certain atoms are allowed to do that. And row three and down in your p-block elements, many of those can be the central atom in violation of the octet rule. So we're going to draw the Lewis structures for these substances as examples. We'll draw beryllium dihydride, boron trifluoride, sulfur hexafluoride, xenon tetrafluoride, and nitrogen monoxide. And we'll draw each of those to illustrate our points for those rules. Look at the beryllium dihydride. And if we got one beryllium times two valence electrons, so one beryllium times two valence electrons for a total of two for contribution from the beryllium. And then for the hydrogen, there's going to be two hydrogens times one valence electron for a total of two. We add that up, we get four total valence electrons. Drawing in our skeleton, we draw our two bonds, which is four electrons, which leaves us with zero valence electrons remaining. At this point, we'll need to evaluate our octet rules and see if we have a violation. In this case, the hydrogen obeys the octet rule, but beryllium does not. I have no valence electrons left. There's no way I can get eight electrons on that beryllium. Remember, we said beryllium was happy with four, so we'll leave the structure as is, and that is the correct structure for beryllium dihydride. And so we're going to allow it to keep four electrons and violate the octet rule. For the boron trifluoride, we got a boron with three valence electrons for a total of three contribution. Then we got the fluorine. We got three fluorines times seven valence electrons for a total of 21. Add that up, we'll get 24 total valence electrons that we're working with. Now we want to draw in our skeleton. We've got one, two, three bonds to connect a boron to each fluorine. Corresponding to six electrons, 24 minus 6 is 18 left. So now we want to evaluate that tent rule. Each fluorine needs six. And if boron were going to obey the octet rule, it would need two. The tendency might be to want to double the bond there or something to accommodate the deficiency in electrons, because 6 times 3 is 18 plus 2 is 20. But boron violates the octet rule, so we're not going to do that. We're two electrons short, which would imply a double bond, but instead we're going to ignore where we had two electrons needed there, we took that away, leaving six electrons needed on each fluorine, and then we're going to proceed as normal, ignoring the violation of the boron. So we add in our non-bonding electrons to each of the fluorine. Six times three is 18. Subtract that, zero. So let's evaluate that. Each fluorine 
has eight. The boron only has six, but that's okay. So we're going to allow fluorine to obey the octet rule, but allow boron to disobey it. And that is a perfectly fine structure for boron trifluoride. Now let's look at some cases where you might have more than eight electrons. Now if you take sulfur hexafluoride, SF6, one sulfur times six valence electrons for a total of six. For the fluorine, we got six fluorine times seven valence electrons for a total of 42. That's going to give us 48 total valence electrons to work with. So we draw in our skeleton. We got six sulfur fluorine bonds. And so that's 12 electrons, 48 minus 12 electrons in our bonds is 36. Evaluate the octet rule. Each fluorine needs six to reach the eight needed. Sulfur has already got more than eight because six bonds is 12 electrons. So we're going to leave that alone. It's already got too many, so let's worry about the fluorine. Adding in six electrons on each of my fluorine atoms, we find that six times six is 36, so 36 minus 36 is zero. Again, sulfur clearly is violating the octet rule because it has more than four bonds. So it's got 12 electrons, violates the octet rule, but fluorine obeys the octet rule, and that would be a correct structure for sulfur hexafluoride. Now we'll look at another compound that violates the octet rule that has too many electrons. We'll look at xenon tetrafluoride. So we look at the xenon. One xenon times eight valence electrons, eight contribution from the xenon. The fluorine, there's four fluorines times seven valence electrons for a total of 28. Adding that up, we get 36 total valence electrons. Now, since xenon is a noble gas, it already has eight electrons, which is going to imply the octet rule is violated right off the bat. Drawing our skeleton, we got four xenon fluorine bonds. Two times four is eight. So subtracting eight electrons will leave us with 28 valence electrons left in our pot. So let's assess the octet rule. Each fluorine needs six. Six times four is 24. The xenon already has eight, so we'll leave it alone for now. Taking away our 24 electrons for the non-bonding electrons on each of the fluorine atoms. So 28 minus 24 is four. So now what do we do with those four electrons that are left? We have four valence electrons left with the octets filled on each of the atoms. Every atom, the fluorines and the xenon, have eight electrons. So these quote-unquote extra electrons will go on the central atom, which is xenon. Adding them in, we added electrons there and there. That takes care of that. And xenon is violating the octet rule in that case because it has 12 total electrons. Which is okay. Xenon's violating the octet rule. Last but not least, we'll have nitrogen monoxide, which one of the atoms will have an odd number of electrons, which is what makes this one a little different. Now, if you look at the nitrogen, one times five is five for the nitrogen. We got one oxygen times six valence electrons for a total of six from the oxygen, which gives us 11 electrons. Since that's an odd number of electrons, there's going to be at least one unpaired electron in the finished structure. That's what we call a free radical, highly reactive type of substance. But let's go ahead and draw in our skeleton, add in our bond, Subtract two, that gives us nine. We're going to violate the octet rule in the end, but let's go ahead and evaluate it. The nitrogen and the oxygen both need six to fill the octet. Six times two is 12, but I've only got nine to work with, so I'm going to end up being short. 
In our case, we're three electrons short. Now, there's no way I can account for the odd electron, but I can at least account for two out of the three. So we'll stick in a double bond. So there's our double bond. We doubled the bond, so we're going to take away two more electrons, so this is seven. Doing that counts for two out of the three electrons, leaving each atom meeting four. Four times two is eight, but I've only got seven. So that means that I'm going to be left with an odd electron somewhere. So it turns out the least electronegative element, in our case the nitrogen, because oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen, will get the odd electron. So I stick in my seven non-bonding electrons. I fill the octet in the oxygen, but I leave the nitrogen with seven electrons instead of eight because I ran out of electrons. Nothing I can do. So but that leaves me with no electrons left over, and so that would be a completed correct structure for nitrogen monoxide. There's my unpaired electron, and it's less than electronegative, so it's getting that odd electron, and it's the one that violates the octet rule. This has been the tutorial part three on drawing of Lewis structures and violations of the octet rule.